We have mentioned several times, and we'll be mentioning over and over again those four words. What upholds your existence? As happy as me, you never see. I started my involvement in therapy back in 1965 when I became involved with a rehab facility called Daytop Village. And they had a basic concept, in fact they called it the concept, to go a step further they took this concept and actually made a play out of it that received remarkable reviews and ran for over two years off Broadway. And it contained many of the things we're going to talk about now. And this concept was formed around a basic idea of dealing with human problems. And when I first started going to therapy groups at Daytop, I didn't know what this formula concept was. All I knew for certain was that something very unusual was taking place. There was a dynamic in effect there that seemed to be doing things that uh, were beyond explanation. Uh, I've got to mention again that this was a facility of 105 hardcore addicts, ex-addicts, who had been paroled or probated by state courts to Daytop. So we're talking about people who were considered the scum of the society, people who had committed every type of crime known to human beings, and had uh, spent a better part of their adult life doing nothing but stealing, copying drugs, putting needles in their arms, and laying up in prison. So here you have this group of people in this facility, sitting around in a circle, dealing with problems in a way that was just remarkable. And you saw the change week by week by week. These people behaved in a way that made you think they were anything but addicts and felons. They were responsible, open, concerned, um, thoughtful hard-working, all the things you would not expect from felons and addicts. And after about three or four of these sessions, I sat down with a young man named Carlos Baez, and I said, Carlos, I know something is going on. There's some kind of a thing going on in this group setting. Um, can you d explain it to me? D does it have a, an actual structure? And he says, of course it does. It's a very basic structure. And he spent the next half hour going over it with me, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And uh, at the end of that half hour, I just uh, sat there and I shook my head and said, why isn't this used everywhere? Well, why this should be taught to children in school at the age of five and six. Everyone should know how this works. It's so basic, it's, a, it's almost simplistic. Mind you, it's not easy in terms of accomplishing what needs to be accomplished, but it's so clear and precise. If you follow it, it works. And this is basically what it is. A, what is the problem? Defining it clearly, not um, as something confusing, something that uh, you can't quite grasp, but what is the essential problem? Defining it clearly. I no longer want to be married. I want a divorce. I want to quit school. I need a new job. I want to shoot dope. I feel violent and uh, suicidal. Whatever it is, just define it clearly so it's no longer this thing that you can't place your fingers on. Two, B, what emotions prevent you from dealing with the problem? And there are always emotions that prevent us from dealing with the problem, basically fear. When you talk to anyone about dealing with almost anything, what crops up almost immediately is fear. The fear of having to go through the changes, fear of um, what people will think, fear of 
changing your life in a way that will be uncomfortable and new to you. But fear is the uppermost thing that prevents us from dealing with human problems. Um, three, what practical elements prevent you from dealing with it? Sometimes there's a practical part of it. Most often it's primarily emotion, but there is also the practical. I recall um, a man who came to me, and he wouldn't tell me what he was coming to me for over the phone, but when he got here, he turned and he said, uh, I'm a chef, I'm an excellent chef, a sushi chef, I hardly ever pronounce that right, sushi chef, and um, I love my work, I love cooking, but I can't stand working for people in the restaurant business. Um, they are not caring, they're not, uh, um, they don't compensate me properly, they don't show me the respect I deserve. I want my own place. <clears throat> I said, oh, is that why you're here? He says, right, I want to have my own restaurant. I said, okay, well, how can I help you with that? He said, well, I need $125,000 to open a restaurant. <laughs> I said, okay. And, um, and he said, well, I'm hoping that somehow hypnosis could help me get the $125,000 to open the restaurant. And I said, well, that's a long stretch. I, I don't think there's $125,000 in, in hypnosis in that way. I said, I think what um, you might do is work on such things as confidence and learning some business skills and uh, you know, developing the ability to um, raise the money you need to open your restaurant. He further explained to me that he had terrible credit, had no money saved, etc. So um, we used hypnosis to deal with those issues and some pr very practical things, uh, getting a business card, um, going out to the people in the restaurant who were eating his food and talking with them, um, getting to know them, um, giving them a business card, building a, 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 some relationships with people who might be interested in investing in the restaurant, opening a little bank account, you know, and putting a little money at least a week, every week in there. Um, so he went about this program, and uh, about, oh, maybe a little under two years later, I got an email from him inviting me to his new restaurant. Um, so sometimes there's the practical. He didn't have any emotional conflict about this. He was a, a risk taker to begin with. He wasn't afraid to do what he wanted to do. But he needed $125,000 and didn't know how to get it. So what is the problem? Define it. What prevents us from dealing with it? The emotional part and the practical part. Dealing with the emotional part, getting in touch with the fear or whatever emotion is involved, working through it so it's no longer stopping you from doing what you need to do. Um, this is a story I'm sure I've told before, but it's appropriate for this. A wonderful friend of mine, Cass McGowan, came to um, groups with me back in 1969, and she was a uh, first impression I got of her is that she was intimidated by people in general, very shy and um, not into herself, but had a hard time of just openly expressing what she was feeling. And we asked her what she was there for, and she said, well, and she went along to explain that she had been working at an insurance agency for about nine years and didn't particularly like the job because the boss was a, a terrible person. Um, wouldn't speak to any of the people that worked for him. He would uh, tell them to send a memo or email them, but he wouldn't actually talk to them. And then he had called her into his office and told her that her supervisor was going on, mat on maternity leave for six months and simply looked at her and said, you will now take over her responsibilities, and that's all. And he dismissed her. And so she described this and how humiliated she felt about the way he had gone through this whole process, didn't uh, do as much as uh, show any respect or congratulate her or offer her a raise or anything, just, you're going to do this, that's it. 
So over the next weeks, we talked to Cass about what she wanted to do. And she said, well, if I could, what I'd want to do is uh, demand that I get a raise and get the respect I deserve and uh, even the title, you know, of you know, the supervisor, since that's what I'm going to be doing. And we talked to her about what was stopping her, and she said, terror, absolute terror. The thought of actually going to that guy's office and knocking on the door and asking to be heard scared her. Um, what we did was devise a script. We actually wrote out a script with dialogue, and we had her rehearse it week after week, and then we had her talk about her decision and whether she would actually make this decision, and she did, and then we asked her for a commitment, and she made a commitment, and we said, well, when are you going to do this? And she said, tomorrow afternoon. And the script was that she would knock on the door, fully expecting him to shout out, what is it, send me a, a memo. And then she would open the door and say, I must speak to you. And then he would shout out again, oh, I won't get you. And she would say, I insist on talking with you now. And then she would say, I want a raise, commensurate with what my job is. And I want the title over my door, or else I will pack my stuff and leave here at 4 o'clock, I'll quit. And she closed the door. And she said that was her commitment. And the, two days later, she came back in the group with a big smile on her face. And she had done it. She said she had been scared. She was a legs, but she, but, and he, of course, had done exactly what she, <laughs> get out here, blah, blah, blah. And she just went in and said, no, I want a raise, and I want the title, and of course, I'm leaving. And she even said that she went back to her desk and started cleaning it out because she, was, she understood that she was taking a risk that he might fire her um, and that she might have to go home and tell her husband, Al, that she had been fired and go through that area of it. But as it turned out, at a quarter to four, he called her into his office and uh, didn't apologize, but he said, okay, you've got the raise and the title. Anything else? And she said, no, and just walked away. <laughs> Real so, people person. <laughs> yeah, um, problem solving. What is the problem? Define it. What prevents you from dealing with it on an emotional level, on a practical level? Finding that practical solution and doing it. Identification. Uh, identification is vital to all of our interests as human beings because what happens when we are in a problem zone when we're really suffering from something that's stopping us from moving ahead in life, is we often feel that we're very much alone. I can't tell you how many times people have said that to me, or they've said also, um, I don't think anyone could understand how I feel. That's a common pattern in people's thinking. And we feel that way because very often we are alone with our problem. We don't share it the way we need to share it. And when we are able to share it and get that human identification from other people. People saying, I do understand, I do identify with you, I felt the same thing myself. It changes the whole complexion of what we're feeling and what we're going through. It humanizes us and it takes us to a different level of understanding. That's one of the reasons why support groups are so positive. We go to a support group and they're not therapeutically skilled to deal with human problems by and large, but people share themselves. An alcoholic who is having a hard time can sit down and talk with other people who have gone through the same thing and even worse. So it works. It's important. Identification. I think I told this group that uh, in a training session at Hofstra University, I was asked about um, something related to dealing with human problems if I dealt with every type. And I said yes, and someone popped up and said, what about cannibalism? Um, truth is, I had, actually at one time, four people, four different people in a group together who had had experiences with cannibalism, and it was the first time they had an opportunity to actually get identification. They had read up on other people's experiences, but they never actually sat with others who had gone through the same experience. And it was, uh, for each of them, a very, very important 
part of their recovery. So it, it is vital. Feedback. This is the one area that we are um, really missing in our lives. We don't get the kind of feedback we need from others, even close friends, family members, um, don't usually give us the kind of feedback we need. Um, we get some indirect feedback, or we get um, hints of feedback, but by and large people are not going to come right out and give you the feedback that you should get. Um, because it might be too painful, you might not want to take it in, might be defensive, etc. and so on. I know that the first time I received feedback at DETOP, it floored me. I was uh, very shocked at what people were seeing in me. I, 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 I was absolutely dumbfounded. I couldn't believe that people were saying the things they were saying to me. Yet I witnessed them saying the same kinds of things to other people, giving the same kind of feedback to others. But when it came to me, and they actually looked at me and said things to me that I felt were very hurtful, um, I, I couldn't take it. My reaction was, I wanted to leave. My reaction to every one of them was, get away from me, you know, what you're talking about, you're a bunch of dope fiends, how dare you say those kinds of things to me. But they were right. Every single thing they said was absolutely on target. And it took me months to be able to get over that hang-up that I had, that most people had, of defensiveness and taking the feedback. I had to understand also that if people were giving me feedback, supposing there were 12 people in a group, and uh, each person was mentioning two or three things to me, so I might be receiving 30 to 40 pieces of feedback. Out of those 30 or 40 pieces of feedback, some of them will be incorrect. Some of them will be projections. And some of them might also be just biting remarks that someone might make um, randomly or flippantly without really having gone over it carefully. What you do with that type of feedback is you ignore it. You don't spend your time and energy thinking about that. You pay attention to the feedback that is accurate. If only two or three things are said that are appropriate to what's going on in your life, that's the feedback you listen to and you act upon. I go so far as to say that if people in general had a source of feedback, it would first of all help them get over their defensiveness, it would make them much more open, and give them the opportunity of finally beginning to act upon the feedback in a positive way and change. But we don't have that opportunity. We don't have the group of people who will look us in the eye and tell us the truth and help us go through the pain of whatever it is they're telling us. So feedback is a vital link to problem solving. It's important that you do not accept feedback from people who don't know what they're talking about. Everyone in our society, unfortunately, loves to give advice. I really have met anyone who won't give you advice quickly. The person who has never had a successful relationship with a woman will tell you what's wrong with your relationship and how to deal with your wife or girlfriend. The guy who's never been successful in business will have all sorts of advice to give you about how you should invest your money and what you should do in business. And we take in this feedback, uh, sometimes thinking, well, it's not going to do any damage, but it does rub off. We, we tend to absorb a lot of nonsense from people who don't know what they're talking about. So the idea is to take in feedback only from those individuals who have successfully navigated the waters that you're going through. Go to someone who knows what he's talking about, who has shown that he understands how to deal with something and has succeeded at doing it. 
Not someone who has failed or doesn't know what he's talking about, but just wants to give you some free advice. Okay. Um, decision. Once you have examined all the aspects of the problem, once you've looked at all the feedback, and there are no unknowns, sometimes there are more unknowns, for instance, sometimes couples will come to me who are going through a very bad divorce, and they're going through legal things, a uh, question of uh, ownership rights, and uh, who gets the house, and who gets the car, and dividing up property, and uh, you know, child visitation, stuff like that. Well, when you're going through things like that, you're not ready for complete decisions because there are unknown factors. But by and large, once you have actually examined everything in relationship to the problem or conflict or issue you're talking about, and you've put it on the scale, and you've looked at it, and there are no more hidden ideas, then it's time to make a decision. Now, needless to say, a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people wait, procrastinate, and that makes it even more difficult and in the process they lose confidence in themselves, they get more frightened, and they perhaps won't make a decision at the time they need to. Now supposing you've put all everything on the scale, you're weighing it, and it's kind of going like this. You know, 50-50, 49-51, the next day back to 50-50, and you're not quite sure what to do. The answer is, make a decision. Otherwise, you're going to keep waiting, keep waiting, keep procrastinating. And that could go on for months or years. So, when it's time to make a decision, make a decision. Supposing you make a mistake, you'll discover that you've made a mistake. And you can change that, you can correct it. But once you have everything you need to know, don't sit there waiting. Make the decision. Can I ask you now? Yeah. Uh, so, for identification and feedback, you can get them from separate people, or you can get any of these parts from separate yeah. people. Wherever those sources are, as long as they are people who understand what they're talking about, there was a wonderful guy that my husband and I went to, and when he approached something like that, he'd have us right on the board how, what was good about it and what was bad about it. And when it's down, when it's out on paper, it was much easier to look at rather than trying to do it in your mind. I couldn't agree more, absolutely. Write it out. Um, in Hollywood, whenever you work on a movie, you have your script, you have your working script, you have a shooting script, and you have individual scripts for each person. You also have boards in which you can actually see each scene. They're drawn up so that you've got the visual idea as well to work with storyboards. So those things always help tremendously. Any way in which you can take in that information on a visual level will help, definitely. What is the problem? Define it. What prevents you from dealing with the problem on an emotional level, on a practical level? Deal with the emotional part of it. Express the feelings. Get in touch with them. And if you have to work through them, as my friend Cass had to rehearse and practice in order to be prepared to express those feelings, do that. Get the identification you need so that you don't feel alone in this problem. Get feedback from whatever source is possible. What did you mean by identification? Um, I'm not alone, you're not alone. Other people understand they've experienced the same thing. They've gone through it, and they share that with you. By the way, it's important to realize that, by and large, what we experience day in, day out, month in, year in, throughout our lifetimes, is pretty much similar to what other people experience. 
the differences are names, dates, places, details. But basically, human beings experience pretty much the same things. The word commitment is so big, it looms so large. Uh, making a decision is not enough. Being committed to the decision is what really counts. At Daytop, and I've told this before and I'll say it again, in a period of one year, going to groups three times a week and marathon sessions, etc., multiplying all these commitments, I came up with about 3,000 commitments that I had heard in a year's time from people, from these 105 addicts, felons, lunatics, extraordinary. And of these 3,000 commitments, how many do you think were kept? 3,000. 3,000 on the nose, every single one of them. Not one commitment was broken. Reasons being that all of these people had been in prison, and in prison, you go by prison law among the convicts, and the law is very strict. You have to really be careful when you say anything to anyone. You say you're going to do something, you better do it. You say you're going to buddy with someone, you better buddy. You say you're going to get someone some cigarettes, you better get them some cigarettes. Every commitment, every promise that's made is kept or else. It's a prison code. It's as basic as that. There is a code in prison and a language, there's a language in prison. And all of these people had this code and the people who developed the concept at Daytop and previously at Synanon understood this code and how to use it in everyday life by immediately stressing the importance of commitment and telling people that that was the number one thing they had to ensure or else they could not stay in that house, in that concept. So when people made a commitment, it was vitally important. And when people would go through the process that we just went through, what's the problem, dealing with the feelings, dealing with the practical, and getting the feedback, getting the identification, making a decision. After the decision was made, someone, usually the strength of the group, and the strength of the group was not someone with a title, or someone who had a particular badge or something, everyone who the strength was. In every group there was a particular person who had the most respect, who had more experience, and when a decision was made, that strength would turn to the person who had made the decision and say, is that a commitment? And there'd usually be a pause and everyone would wait, and the person would say yes. And once that commitment was made, like, that's it. We have to learn how to do that, how to make commitments. Commitment basically is an honor code with yourself. You're signing a contract with you. Your honor is at stake, your character, who you are. Not just the word, I'm committed, I'm going to do this, but you're basically saying, I value myself, I have self-respect, I will follow this commitment, I will do it. And then, follow-up. There's always follow-up to the commitment. As Cass recognized, she still had problems with her boss because uh, her supervisor never came back to work. She decided to stay at home with the baby. So Cass had to take this job permanently. And she had to go back to him and iron out the contract. And she went back into rehearsal in the group and talked about it in group, what she wanted, long range in terms of uh, pension, insurance, etc., and so on. And had to go through the banging on the door again and making her demands and out her way. So there's almost always follow-up. The guy who opened the restaurant, the sushi, Jeff contacted me uh, many months later, wanted to see me again, and I said, how's everything going? He says, oh, wonderful, restaurant successful. Uh, in fact, he said uh, he was writing a book now on his recipes. He was very excited about it. And I said, well, what do you come to me for? He says, well, um, I know how to cook. 
Um, but I'm not very good at managing a restaurant. <laughs> I've got to learn that part of it as well. So that was his follow-up. He had to figure out how to work with people on another level when you're in a chef. When, when you're just cooking for someone, that's one thing. But when you're cooking and you're managing something, then it's another thing. So that is the basic formula. It's not any kind of rocket science. It's not, but there's not, no confusion here. And again, it's not easy. You actually have to do this. You have to actually go through the process of defining your problem, getting in touch with what's preventing you from dealing with it, both on an emotional and practical level, dealing with the emotional and the practical part, getting identification, taking in feedback, weighing everything carefully, making a decision, then making a commitment, and then following up. Very basic formula. It works. It absolutely works. It worked for all of these people. And again, if it can work for those people, it can work for anyone who is earnest about doing something with their lives. In fact, these people, by and large, not only succeeded in their two years at Daytop and graduated, but I would say that safely 50 to 60 percent of them started their own programs, spawned hundreds of programs throughout this country that have helped millions of people over the decades. All because of this basic concept which was taught. Any questions about it? Okay. Can you talk about commitments a little? Like you, you say how they all um, kept all their commitments, but I know sometimes those commitments are you know really long term yeah, thing, like not yeah. smoking again or something. And That's where follow up comes in. Yeah. Some guy might make a commitment to um, contact his uh, wife and children for the first time. A lot of these people had broke, came from broken homes. A lot of the people, of course, lost their families being in prison. And for many of them, uh, there was a level of irresponsibility involved that had to be dealt with. And uh, when it came to things like that, finally someone would say, OK, I'm going to contact my kids finally. They haven't heard from dad. Uh, you know." And, years and there was a follow-up to that well, what are you going to do supposing they don't want to see you supposing there are a lot of problems you know going on supposing you have failed to be responsible in many other areas that you're not even aware of so there's going to be follow-up yeah and the follow-up was there and that was a one of the things that happened at they of course was that there was a tremendous amount of follow-up on a daily basis with people not just in group but out of group and seminars and um, talks individually with people. Um, so you were constantly dealing with things. The byword at Daytop always between people were talk about it, deal with it. They'd get in your face constantly. If something was going wrong, they'd go right at you. Someone would confront you. You wouldn't get away with it. For months, people would just look at me and say, talk about it, Nick, talk about it already, you know. So that kind of pressure also is important along with the feedback. You're in a situation where you have to deal with things. Unfortunately, most people are not in that situation. Uh, and so we tend to be very lax and wait and wait. Um, as I've said any number of times, we all need a day top. We all need that kind of presence in our life they will go somewhere where people are going to be honest with you and where you will have to deal with stuff, where you can't just slip and slide and ignore everything going on in your life. Could we do some role playing at some point? Yeah, we're going to get, we're going to be getting right to that very soon. In fact, right after, now I want to go right into the actual doing of this stuff among people. Um, not just role playing, but actually doing it. Would people like to do that? Mm. I would. <laughs> yeah. I have a couple other questions yeah. about commitment, too. Okay. Um, so you've said that it's okay to make mistakes. Like if you do, you said, told me once how somebody had smoked just out of habit to have yeah. lunch. And so you could, um, when you're talking about a long term commitment, as long as you're committed to the long term thing, it's like, okay to make mistakes in that. So when these people made their commitments, like there might have been, you know, oh, some sure. 
the states sure. along the way, but they ultimately kept kept up with it. Gotta remember that they were there for two years. Okay. And everyone knew everyone intimately. When I say intimately, I mean you'd sit in a marathon session with people for forty to sixty hours. And in that kind of a situation, you really got to know people in the deepest way. So everyone knew each other very, very well. Everyone knew each other's hang-ups, each other's problems, each other's personalities, what people were working on, what commitments they had to deal with. There was nothing hidden. It was all out there. My experience with a broken commitment is uh, you own up to it. You know, I had this commitment and I didn't follow through. I broke my commitment. And then at that point, you apologize for any impact that that might have had. On, or that did have on people, and then uh, you have the opportunity to say, I recommit, or this isn't what I commit to, and I, you know, and change. Yes. There are different shades to it, of course. Um, some people would commit to a relationship that they talked There were relationships between people going on, and um, it wasn't an easy kind of thing in that setting to have a relationship with someone because everyone knew what was going on, and if something was wrong, they would be confronting each other in a group, or others would be confronting them. Um, pulling covers was another term that's being always used at daytop. If uh, someone was not dealing with something, if a couple was not really following up on commitments day and night, someone would pull their covers, would expose it. You know, Just look at them and say, hey, what's going on, you two? We made a commitment to really deal with X, Y, and Z, but I watched you the other day, you two got in each other's face and said, no, I don't want to talk about it, and you walked away. So people would pull your covers, another great advantage, because that doesn't happen to us. We get away with our lies and our games, and no one pulls our covers unless they're trying to hurt us, perhaps. story about how when you about when you quit smoking that you had first said that you were going to cut back and and this I, whole plant right. but that, that that like they confronted you and said that's not a real commitment right. like, the only real commitment they is they pulled to my covers completely mm -hmm. yeah. I knew that it was important to model for other people and whenever I started a new training program which happened every year I always began by talking about my essential problem or conflict. And after a number of years, I had, I didn't have a major one that I was dealing with. So I sat up the night before the training session trying to figure out what I would talk about. And I sat there smoking. I, at the time, I was smoking four packs a day. And I suddenly looked at the cigarette in my hand and said, wow, that's it. That's what I'll talk about. So what I did, I devised a scheme, a script that I would run on them. So the next day in the training program, there were 16 people. I said, um, I'm smoking four packs a day, and I realized that it's not a healthy thing to do. So I decided that I am going to do a number of things to correct that. Number one, I'm going to immediately start cutting back. Number two, I'm going to acknowledge the fact that I have a problem smoking, that long term it's going to be dangerous. I remember my father, you know, coughing and choking, you know, from all that, you know, nicotine in his lungs. Number three, I'm going to go back to some exercising to build up my health a little more. Uh, number four, I'm going to think long range in terms of in the future I'm going to have to quit. So I ran this elaborate little story and uh, the people just looked at me and some of the people not it sounds good. And one young 16-year-old kid named um, Harry, who had been coming to groups for a year and had been selected to be a member of the new coming staff, kind of looked at me and, and he just had this look on his face. And, and he looked at me and said, Nicholas, if I were to run that load of crap on you in a group, you'd laugh at me. And he really pulled my covers and left me, you know. And suddenly everybody recognized what I had done. And kind of, and this kid just reached right over to my 
pocket where my pack of viceroys was and slammed it on the floor and said, what are you going to do? And I was trapped, absolutely trapped. And I said, well, I'm going to quit. And someone else, when? <laughs> <laughs> um, right now, another person. For how long? Uh, for good. Does that mean for the rest of your life? I mean, they were hot <laughs> <laughs> tying me and shackling me. And they, they, I had trained them well. I really had trained them well. They knew how to do this. Um, and, and so I said, yeah, I'm quitting. And they made me spell it out. You're going to stop smoking as of this moment, and you're quitting for the rest of your life. Is that what you've decided? Yes. Is that a commitment? Yes. Over and done with it. So, now, supposing I had broken that commitment, um, I would have had to have done exactly what you're mentioning. I would have had to come forward and say, I'm having a hard time, or I messed up yesterday and actually had a cigarette. As it was, I didn't break that commitment. I can look anyone in the eye and say that in the 48 years of being involved in this concept, I have not broken a commitment. Um, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, I'm happy I learned the importance of doing that also. Learned the importance of where true self-respect comes from. It comes from honoring what you say. From God's on board, each day I die. From the Bering Straits to Palestine. This spring, this brook will ring the bell. No need of wealth, you're in God's hotel.